So again, you know, decentralized identity, two different aspects, very different uh, ideology and architecture. So who am I? I'm Christopher Allen. I'm currently the executive director of Blockchain Commons. It's a benefit organization for supporting the stability, the research, and the infrastructure for blockchains. I'm co-author of the SSL TLS standard. I am the co-inventor and architect of decentralized identifiers, author of design principles of self-sovereign identity, which we're going to talk about later. I am the co-chair of the W3C credentials. The, uh, most recently, I was principal architect at Blockstream. If you know anything about Bitcoin, Liquid, Elements, etc., I was part of that team. And uh, my Twitter is at Christopher A. So ideology and architecture. I'm going to start with ideology. So why am I so passionate about this? Why have I taken pay cuts, uh, used my vacation time and free time to move this agenda forward? I want to start with a story, Amira. Who is she? Well, she's going to improve the lives of millions of people. She legally immigrated to the United States. She's now an engineer in Boston. But her extended family lives in Syria. And new anti-immigrant policies in the US concern her. We want everyone, all of you, including Amira, to achieve their maximum potential. So how do, does Amira and you participate in a world of fear? So self-sovereign identity is both an ideology to reclaim human dignity and authority in the digital world, as well as an emerging architecture of technology designed to enable that movement. It will benefit both businesses and communities, and it will help Amira meet her potential. So why am I doing this? Well, first off, it's based on the principles of enlightenment and, of course, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Those are the fundamental principles. It begins with the basic premise that you should control your own identity in relationships and interactions with other people. Uh, because that's what it's like in real world. You know, you have a choice. You can walk out of the room. You should have control over your digital selves as well as your physical selves. It's not perfect control, it's not complete, but that's the way things should work. You know, as children, we learn appropriate boundaries. As adults, we're expected to understand what those are. We need that in the digital world. We all have inherent dignity, independent of where we're born, who our parents were, or other labels about us, simply because we're human. Now, digital identity today is largely administered by centralized authorities. You know, governments, you know, things like passports, corporations, your employment ID, or a variety of uh, software platform providers, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft. They all have a vested interest in managing you in both your online and offline lives. And why do they want to do that? Well, they're there to enforce a social contract. Right? You know, you are a citizen in Switzerland or wherever your country um, of citizenship is, and you have a social contract with various parties. Uh, when you're an employer, you have a social contract with them. They have a vested interest in enforcing that social contract. And they also want to lock others out from uh, changing the rules of that social contract. Now, this, that sounds okay, it's reasonable, but why not? Well, our relationships with authorities are changing. We are more and more part of a global civil society. We are increasingly part of networks rather than hierarchies. You know, it used to be, you know, we have our loyalty to our town, and our town has our loyalty to the canton, and the canton to our nation. Um, now, we, it's much more complex. You know, we have, you know, all kinds of different relationships. Um, and the borders of those relationships are changing. We have the, the European Union, this weird kind of quasi-federal federation of many nation states. We have our nation states. 
Um, regional states are now uh, you know, expressing their authority. In the United States, Wyoming is making a lot of rules that are different than the rest of the country around blockchains. Scotland is having us come out and talk with them about um, different forms of identity. Here in, the, in Switzerland, the different cantons are doing different experiments with identity. There's also indigenous peoples uh, who have tribal and ethnic um, identity, First Nations. There's uh, a Mohawk indigenous people that are half in Canada and half in the US, and they're very confused as to, you know, what is the authority? The Mo authority should be to the Mohawk Nation. And then we have all these city-states, you know, London is huge, the SF Bay Area, um, and then some people even say that, you know, Boston, Boston to Washington in the United States is one big megalopolis. Corporations and employment cross borders as well. Uh, how many of you work with a company who has uh, offices or people outside of the, their country of registration? I would suspect almost all of you do. Um, all of these parties are renegotiating the nature of what it means to be sovereign in this world. The problem is, is that they're ignoring the voices of ordinary people in these negotiations. And yet the risks, the existential risks to us are significantly greater. We can have great harm that can basically forever hurt us that a powerful nation or a powerful group of people can basically avoid. So the principle of self-sovereignty gives individuals a voice in this renegotiation of what it means to be a human in the digital world. There are also a variety of security risks with centralized authorities. We've all heard the stories of huge centralized repositories being stolen. I mean, Yahoo, three billion um, uh, people's personal information. Equifax, 143 million people. Uh, centralization is, it's very hard to be resilient when everything's all in one place. But then when things go wrong, it's like, oh, nobody's responsible. We have no recourse as individuals. Um, the, in India, people are dying because of a, of a system that is saving the Indian government billions of dollars, but there are people that are falling through the cracks because there's no recourse for them. Significant possibilities for abuse of power. Centralized authorities can use their dominance and their asymmetric access to information to give them advantages. This is happening with corporate use of identity. Lack of transparency. You have no idea how your identity, your personal information, and your relationships are used for you or against you. You just don't know. And finally, as a technologist, I'll say we're hitting limits. The current architectures that we use in computing today for digital identity have their roots that were created 40 years ago when we had mainframes, when we had simple nation state identity, when the company we worked for, we probably worked for our entire life. That is not the state of the way the world works today. We're hitting the limits of those architectures. So we have to move on. There are some other reasons why we have to do this now. Human rights. So there's 1.1 billion people that have no legal identity, and there are tens of millions of people that are stateless refugees that, you know, where the sources of their identity are basically saying, no, they're not ours. GDPR. In the European Union and the states that recognize the rules there, there are increasing protections there. And, the, and uh, some really important changes in how the nature of business in Europe is happening. There's also these mega digital identity projects. Uh, the Chinese social credit is one of the biggest ones, but there's also the India Adhar card that I talked about. They've registered over a billion Indian citizens. It violates some of the best practices of the last uh, decade or two of, uh, of practices for first world identity work. There are very few laws that are effective around profiling, discrimination, abuse by law enforcement a large number of biometric abuses, and of course, there's no recourse. Identity administrators, administrators do not have the authority to fix the problems, and people are dying. Save a billion dollars, oh, a couple of hundred people die because of it. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not quite the way I want to see the world. 
Other changes, um, xenophobia. The xenophobic right has risen around the world. Most recently, we've seen in Brazil, uh, but you know it's all over the place. Uh, uh, in Great Britain, uh, Poland, Turkey, USA with Trump, et cetera, we're seeing the rise of xenophobia. It's becoming normalized. It's like beginning to be okay to be xenophobic. This encourages violations of human rights. Um, academics, critics, journalists, researchers like myself and others have all been targeted by these um, people in a variety of ways. Uh, these new dangers require us to have new ways to protect our identities. And in particular, I had this slide here in Europe because we've learned some lessons here in Europe. Um, Holland had the best civil service system during the 20s depression. They saved lives by being effective and redistributing food and dealing with all different kinds of problems of uh, the, the 1930s depression, excuse me. But when, the, uh, when Hitler and the Germans came in, more Jews, gays, and gypsies died as a percentage of population in Holland than they did in Germany, which they had total control. That was because they had information about everybody. And every, I think it's May 25th, the, the uh, bells are rung for the, the martyrs who died trying to burn down those archives uh, that uh, were used by the Hitler regime. Things change, times change, leaders change. This is, I think, one of the reasons why GDPR is one of the more powerful rules of, around privacy and identity. Is there are people who remember that history. Finally, coming back to technology, the same tools that we're using to protect buyers, sellers, traders, auctioneers in the digital world, the same technology we're using for Bitcoin, et cetera, we can use these to make the world more fair, the world more transparent, and to defend the helpless. So we should do so. I wrote two and a half years ago, The Path to self sovereign Identity, where I kind of coined this term for the category here. The term had maybe been used before, but I really wanted to focus on these 10 principles. Uh, existence, control, access, transparency, persistence, portability, interoperability, consent, minimization, protection. I didn't firmly define what exactly is uh, self-sovereign identity, I instead, instead said, it is all of these. You need all of these in some fashion for it to be self-sovereign. Uh, here's a little more details on each. We don't really have time to go into every single one, but I do want to go into the first one, existence. Users have independent existem, existence. They are never wholly digital. This first principle is that we exist independent of whether or not we have a digital existence. We are here. We are a real human being. We have a real physical existence. And in our physical existence, we have a control over ourselves. It's one of our fundamental rights. Nobody can say, I'm sorry, Chris, I need your heart because I'm going to give it to a more deserving child. Uh, nobody can, can base, I can't sell myself into slavery. There are limitations. These are what are known as unalienable rights. We need to have these unalienable rights in the digital world. Why? Well, our digital representations are more and more how we engage in the world. It's not just me and handshaking with you physically in this, in this room. More and more, you're meeting me first online. Thus, a free society demands that we're given a voice in deciding how these digital representations are created and used. And it's not because we own our digital representations. It's because, as individual beings, the only valid source of moral authority is us, just like it is in the real world. This means something subtle, and on this slide needs work and probably divided into, into more, but identity is not property. It's, um, you know, human rights are universal, they're indivisible, they're unalienable. Property can be divided, it can be, you know, swapped around, etc. So when we speak about digital identity, we should really avoid the words own or ownership. We should speak about the individual's right to control the relationships and the, and the uh, digital identity in a similar way that we talk about our ability to control what we do. I'm going to go to work today. I'm not going to go to work today, and I will face the consequences of it. Very similar. 
Just because something can seem property-like does not mean that it is or should be subject to property laws. This is a very common mistake in the Western world. Human dignity. It demands that individuals be treated with respect. When I come into the room and I look you in the eye, you are likely to, to treat me with respect, no matter what way or reason why that we're together. We need that in our online lives. It's not just face-to-face, -face, but also online. Without that, we become nothing but data in a machine. We become that troll that nobody wants to, uh, to talk about because he keeps on saying, Digital identity, we have to be careful, we have to be um, honest. Um, we don't want to be entries in a ledger that have to be managed, problems to be solved. We do not wish to be digital serfs, because we're not, we're people. Now, this does not mean that we're in complete control of our identities. We're all part of relationships and connections but it defines a border between your identity and your, things you control and the things that I control. Um, and outside of this line, which is there's this uh, judge who's reported to say, the right to swing your arm ends just where the other man's nose begins. Uh, we ought to, outside of that particular line, we ought to be able to negotiate as peers. You know, I don't want to have to bow down to you to basically say, oh, I need your permission to do everything. So that is just an exploration of the first principle of self-sovereign identity. There are nine more. And I encourage you to take a look at the original article and some of the subsequent work. And I also welcome uh, if you know new ideas. We're in the process in rebooting Web of Trust to investigate how can we take these principles further? How can we define them more accurately, et cetera? So if you're interested in that, talk with me later. I do have to give a caution. These principles attempt to ensure user control. But remember, no matter what you do, identity is a two-edged two sword. It can be used both ways. We want to balance transparency, fairness, support of the commons, all the different things we have in a civil society uh, with the protection uh, for the individual. And sometimes that's a hard balance, you know, in trying to desire fairness and accountability and prevent different kinds of problems. Um, that can conflict with these personal freedoms. And in my particular choice, and when we balance that, if all things else are equal, I want to err toward the individual. The people in power have resources, money, uh, ex you know, relationships, et cetera, that will help them solve the problem. It's the people that are the individuals who are much less likely to have so. I want to err toward the individual. So grand vision, ideology, some great rah, rah, rah. How do we get there? Well. It's a hard problem. There are a lot of tangled up pieces here. So where do we begin? Well, a particular place we've decided to begin in the community is around credentials. So what is a credential? Well, it's evidence of some authority to do something, some status, some rights, privileges, usually written in some kind of written form. You've seen them, driver's licenses, passports, et cetera. It typically contains some information about a subject. It's issued by somebody who says, this is the authority that I am granting you. There's usually some evidence and some other information about what it is and why you're entitled to drive a car or uh, practice psychology um, in, the, in the medical marketplace. Um, and it has some information about usage, which might include some biometrics. It might include some uh, you know, dates and times that it's valid for, renewal requirements, et cetera. A digital credential should be able to do all that. Um, and it can add some additional elements. First off, with uh, a lot of the uh, cryptography today, we can make it much more tamper-proof, much more difficult for people to be able to copy it, abuse it, change the different things. And we can basically present a variety of different credentials together in what is known as a presentation. Um, this is a much more convenient than, you know, pulling out wherever I've hidden my driver's license and, and giving it to somebody. I should be able to put the whole package together and establish trust at a distance. That's the ideal. 
So there are some terms we use in this. There are the issuers, governments, employers, et cetera, who issue credentials to holders. They're the people who hold it, which may not be the subject. Um, you know, your, uh, uh, your wife may have some, uh, hold some credentials on your behalf because you have a relationship with each other. So holders are not necessarily the subjects. And then we have people who want to use that information, the cop, the uh, uh, pharmacist, et cetera, to be able to uh, validate it, that it's valid and thus can give you your medicines. Um, this has caused a number of problems over the years with uh, digital credentials, overuse of identifiers in the United States. I think social security numbers are not supposed to have been used legally for 20, it's at least 20 years old that it's against the law to use it, and I still get asked for it all the time. Um, we've all experienced the limitations of names and passwords. Um, our personal data and reputation gets locked down by the big corporations, whether or not it's your employer or something like Facebook. Our personal identifiable information is being bought and sold. Um, it's easily stolen en masse, Yahoo, Expedia, et cetera. Uh, there's also other problems like ambient authority. That's where we share a password with a, a spouse or assistant, which maybe we shouldn't be allowed to do in certain cases. And then finally, there's uh, what is known as being a digital refugee. I have a bunch of students who took a course from me um, and got a sustainable MBA from Bainbridge Graduate Institute. They paid $50,000, $60,000 to get this MBA. Well, Bainbridge Graduate Institute then got, became Pincho.edu, which then got bought by Presidio, which may not exist next year because they're having financial problems. What do all these people who have this degree do when the issuer no longer exists? They're digital refugees. We want to solve that problem. One of the other things that causes problems with digital credentials is we have many identities, each with different contexts. I mean, just in our own families, we have our spouse's family, maybe our ex's family, all kinds of blended combinations. We have friends from different eras of our life, our high school friends, you know, our early career friends, other careers. Uh, we all belong to different communities, different lifestyles, etc., and lots of different institutions. It's that whole borders thing we were talking about earlier. So each of these contexts has an identifier. And in the digital world, it's so easy to make an identifier. I'm going to make you a number. I'm going to make you a number. I'm going to give you all numbers. These numbers end up causing us problems because they connect us to contexts. Those contexts connect, connect us to society as a whole. We have all these intermediaries who want to wedge in and take over our context because there's so many of them. Uh, this makes them unmanageable. So we want to try to solve this unmanageable context. And the place we want to solve it is with the identifier. That's the first place. So if you look at this California identifier, it's a number. It's not my name. It's not anything else. It's something unique that the, the California um, uh, driver's License Bureau issued to me. Uh, we want to change the nature of that identifier to make it work in a more self-sovereign way. And part of the reason we want to do this is that uh, all these identifiers we're getting, we don't actually control them. Um, the URL that you may have, you know, I um, own the domain Life with Alacrity. No, I don't. I lease it on a yearly basis from a DNS provider who leases it from a global name, top level domain provider who leases it from ICANN. It can be taken away from me at any time. Phone numbers are loaned to you. As soon as you don't pay your bill in a month or so, somebody else has got your phone number. Uh, government issued identifiers, often misused and used commercially when they're not supposed to be. Management of identifiers is getting so difficult that now we're outsourcing it to all these other people to manage our identifiers. This costs problems with uh, data portability, privacy, security. Let's solve those problems. So again, digital identifiers today, issuers, holders, identifiers, centralized name systems that can be taken away. What we want is to create many identifiers. We want to be able to do them for persons, organizations, or things. We want those identifiers to be portable. We don't want them to depend on a centralized authority. We want to use cryptography to protect them and enable privacy and data portability. 
Our solution is something called the decentralized identifier. It's a new type of URL that's globally unique, highly available, cryptographically verifiable, and has no centralized authority. In this world, we, all, we still have issuers, holders, and verifiers, but they all have decentralized identifiers that they have gotten from a variety of different places, and those are basically secured underneath by blockchains and uh, other uh, digital, um, decentralized hash table technologies. We're not making a choice as to which one. We're actually trying to support as many as we can. You'll see here you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, some proprietary blockchains. We want to support them all. What does a DID look like? Well, it's this a number. Um, it, the example on the bottom is a real one. That's uh, DID on Bitcoin, and that's uh, uh, information on how to get my keys on from Bitcoin to be able to verify certain identity things. Like a telephone number, like a uh, IP address, hopefully you will never see a DID. It's going to be hidden deep down underneath. But it solves a lot of problems for us. Um, they're uh, going to be used by a variety of different people. Your cell phone might have a uh, de decentralized D. Your car may have a decentralized ID. Your company as well as yourself. Registered on blockchains, created and managed by digital wallets. Okay, so I've got this thing. What do I do next? Well, when you do that, it allows me to get what is known as a DID document. And this may be you know, diving a little bit deep for this particular community, but it lets me be able to know how can I authenticate that you really are the person who controls that DID. There might be other key material that allows me to communicate with other authorities who have different rules about how keys are managed or used. And then I can also go to various services that you may use. So in my case, you might go to, um, uh, to Twitter to find out um, information and be able to communicate with me via Twitter or something of that nature. Um, so DIDs resolve to DID documents. Inside those documents are public keys, service endpoints, timestamps, proofs. And they define the rules for how it's changed. How many people have played around with PGP? So a decent number of people. It's really hard to rotate your keys. We just were trying to do a little key ceremony right now, and it's like, which key was it? And I have all these ones that have expired, but there's no way to say that they've been expired. Uh, we need to be able to create, read, update, and revoke keys. How do we do so in a responsible fashion? Well, a DID document tells you how to do that. We need to be able to prove that we control it, and there may be other identifier material, but you'll note no personal data. We don't put personal data onto blockchains. Bad idea. Uh, we just want to be able to prove control of this identifier. And you remember, that was not my name that was on there. Um, so this then allows me to create what are known as verifiable credentials. So we're substituting the driver's license number instead with a decentralized identifier. A lot of the other information remains the same. This allows me to make DIDs that are much more powerful. I can basically say, I'm over 21, I don't need to give my birthday. I can do things like uh, say that I am a professor and thus be able to teach uh, in a particular institution. A variety of different things can be much more um, expressive as to how we do things. There are a lot of DID verifiable claim implementations to date. I've been working on a Bitcoin one that's very oriented towards sort of the anonymous, uh, decentralized and censorship resistant use cases. Uh, Blockstack you may have heard of. Uh, there are several Ethereum ones, ERC-725 and Uport. Uh, the IPFS and IDB I, interplanetary database also have uh, uh, DID implementation, and then Sovereign and Veras One are two private companies that also have uh, decentralized. These uh, implementations are all uh, in the method registry, and there are a number of others that have emerged in the last month or so, um, and there'll be more in the future. These are some of the companies that are committed to this particular architecture. You will see on here IBM, Microsoft, um, you will see British Columbia, a lot of different startups, um, some, some big institutions. So this is not a small thing. And there's increasing government support. 
Homeland Security in the United States has basically said in their testimony to the Congress that they plan in the next couple of years to require decentralized identifiers and, and verifiable claims for a number of future U.S. government um, uh, procurement practices. So well, that'll be coming out in uh, the next couple of years. Uh, in particular, why governments are interested in it is it crosses borders. Even the US can't demand that Switzerland do a particular thing. A, uh, they need to be able to work with Switzerland identifiers. This allows for improvements to supply chain management and to, counter, uh, to stop counterfeit goods, et cetera. That's why governments uh, largely are being involved right now. A lot of future work to do. There, you know, this whole process of how do you authorize that you control a DID. Clearly, I can do it with passwords right now, say with BTCR, but people want to be able to use biometrics. Biometrics are dangerous. Uh, so how do we do biometrics safely is an open uh, discussion. Um, universal DID resolvers. We may have a lot of different DID methods, but how do we get the different methods to talk to each other? Uh, a variety of companies like Microsoft want to have what are known as identity hubs, where you can basically encrypt your data and put it up in, a, on, in the cloud so that it can be your agent and act on your, on your behalf safely and securely. A lot of things around how we do delegation and stewardship for your uh, elderly parents or for your children, those are interesting problem spaces. Social key recovery is an active uh, discussion. How do we protect these keys that we've all collected and managed and not have them be lost in a fire? Uh, pet names, other kinds of name-related things, and then very much uh, in my area, how can we allow for anonymous and web of trust reputation? Who is behind this? It's a variety of different groups. We start off with ideas. We go to incubation of those ideas, refinement, and then to standards. So where are we on this? Well, we have a variety of workshops. There's something called the Internet Identity Workshop, meets twice a year, and it's kind of a confab of ideas and sharing. Uh, this is the URL, Internet Identity Workshop. The next one is in April. This then leads to a different community called Rebooting Web of the Trust. How many people have been to a hackathon? Do you know how a hackathon works? OK. Uh, rebooting a web, tr web of trust is a lot like a hackathon, except it's about writing papers. So we basically sit down as a group and take the different skills and capabilities that everybody has and come up with something that we can do in three days that will change the world. So even if you're a psychotherapist or you're a C engineer or whatever, there's gonna be one of these groups that you're gonna be able to contribute to to make a difference. We've done over 50 white papers and it's had a huge impact. Our next event is uh, February 27th uh, through March 1st. Um, we are really hoping that uh, either the one in February or the one in September um, is going to be uh, here in Europe. So we've had some people in Berlin say, oh, it'd be great to be up here, but they don't have a space big for us, big enough for us. We've had some people in Luzanne say, oh, we should do it here. We've had some people in Malta, uh, maybe Zurich. Maybe this would be a good place to do a rebooting Web of Trust. So either February 27th through March 1st, or the other alternative is our second one next year, which is September 18th through 20th. So if you're interested in seeing a rebooting Web of Trust to be here in this community, start talking with us now. So we incubate the standards. Now where do we go? So W3C is one of the main places we go to. Uh, it's the World Wide Web Consortium. It defines all the standards by which um, we uh, interact with the web, HTML, HTTP, you know, how your web interfaces work, JavaScript, et cetera. Um, I am co-chair of the credentials community, and we have kind of a sort of a perpetual existence, uh, incubating and nurturing these things. Uh, we basically then charter these subgroups that have a limited period of time. I cannot, as the chair of the credentials community group, make an international standard that has legal standing in government and, and other organizations. But I can basically charter and do the process to get chartered a working group which can make international standards. And they can only, they basically are chartered for a two year period of time. And in many countries, those basically have a kind of a regulatory semi-force of law. Um, where are we with that? Um, 
The uh, decentralized identify, I'm just gonna jump ahead. The verifiable claims working group has already been chartered. Um, they've been in existence now for um, almost two years. They're near the final phases. Uh, so the verifiable claim standard hopefully will be candidate recommendation in January and a final release in March. So that means people can begin to use those in international standards work. What we're trying to do right now is create a DID working group to actually formalize uh, the DID stuff that you've already seen. There are little uh, places where we can use uh, t uh, different companies, any companies doing anything with digital identity ought to be playing in this uh, sandbox to help us get DIDs uh, firmly established as a working group. And I'm going to end with this uh, link at the bottom, bit.ly, SSI paper underline feedback. Um, this is probably one of the best white papers in the last month or two on self-sovereign identity. Has a lot of the details and rationale for all the different stuff that I've talked in my white paper in this presentation is in this white paper. And if you wish to contact me, uh, email is Christopher A. With life, at lifewithalacrity.com. I just saw a typo, and I'll fix that later, um, which is I'm at Christopher A., not at Christopher Allen. I don't know where that came from. Autocorrect. Um, so that's it for my presentation, so I'm open for questions. Go ahead. Thanks a lot for the great um, uh, discussion and um, ideas about the digital ident identity. In Switzerland, we have um, a little group here uh, with a couple of uh, companies who try to come also up with a digital ID. And I truly believe that the decentralized approach is much, uh, much better, actually. The big question, though, is for me, because I saw some, some names a um, couple of slides earlier, um, about some big companies who would like to participate there. How do you convince them? Because what I have seen is you can use my identity and you can trust me. Uh, I don't want to trust you because I don't trust you. So how do you get some of the buy-in from those big companies that they are truly um, buying into a decentralized um, system? So there are a couple of different issues here, one of which is that there's nothing that stops you from using this architecture to replicate the trust systems that exist today. You, your company has a bilateral relationship with another company, and you basically decided to respect each other's identifiers. That's not too, I mean, people are doing that now, not too hard. What we want them to do is move to the next level instead of uh, actually respecting each other's identifiers, we want them to respect each other's verifiable claims that they issue. So if I'm IBM and I issue a verifiable claim that you are a valid employee and uh, you know, you're basically doing some business, that employee can represent things. Rather than me sharing an identifier, I'm sharing a verifiable claim. The long-term advantage of that is that you know, as we move to these architectures where he controls his keys, later when he relinquishes that verifiable claim that he's an employee with IBM and goes to work for somebody else, he can still have a relationship with your company because your company may have said, hey, he's a really great person to work with. That doesn't go away when he leaves IBM. Um, so again, we can replicate a lot of what we've got right now, do it more securely, allow some for more flexibility, and not you know, have you in these digital silos. Over here, middle. Thank you. Um, just a philosophical question. So <clears throat> if I see a nation as a uh, provider, like um, an identity as a service pro provider, the moment I get a passport, right, I get also like an SLA. So the nation will look for me to have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, things like good streets in, in return of taxes. But the moment I lose identity, somebody will warranty that I get it back or uh, that, some, that some law will be applied the correct way. In a, in a decentralized way, the moment I lose my identity, practically, I don't know, uh, I have secured it with biometric, I'm blinded now. Uh, so who is, who is giving me that warranty? Who is looking for me whenever <clears throat> I'm now on my own? Fortunately, that's one of the easy answers, which is the first principle of digital identity is what? Your physical self 
and the dignity of you as a real person come first, okay? So that means there has to be in the regulations, in how you do the processes, et cetera, for some way for you to be able to go back and be able to recover the verifiable claim that says you have a valid um, citizenship in the country of, of your origin. There has to be a process for that. That has to be first. The fact that you've asked, you know, uh, we had a fire near um, where I live in California that was so bad that pipes six feet underneath the ground melted. And fireproof safes evaporated. Okay, so any key protection, various things or whatever, all gone. Uh, that means that we have to have systems that allow for people to be able to recover from these types of things, just as you would in the real world. So, um, the, you know, yes, it will be a pain in the ass when you've got to go back to the various places to recover that, but there should be a process for doing that. And do those first papers will, and do those first papers which are working on and a few projects which are being soon to be seen. Uh, do they work on that very first principle already? Or is this something which will come piece by piece? Uh, or? I would like to believe that it is you know, firmly in the ecosystem at all levels. And I will say, no, it's not. I mean, there are a lot of people who basically say, oh, this whole ideology thing, you know, Microsoft has a new white paper on self-owned identity, um, which violates two things. I don't believe in ownership, uh, because if it's self-owned, that means it's self-sellable, and I don't think that's true. Um, but it's watering it down. But the architecture is a good architecture. So, um, you know, as I uh, go to Hong Kong, um, and try to sell self-sovereign identity. They don't want to see the first half of that slide deck. They love the second half. So, um, you know, it's a balance. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, since you're affiliated with uh, W3C, I was wondering, um, I mean, I'm pretty sure you've heard of the WebID um, project, and I was wondering um, what your opinion about that is and um, whether you're in any way, like, trying to integrate both technologies. Yeah, so there is a meeting in, this, I think it's December 12th in Seattle um, with a variety of communities that are talking about um, uh, web-based identifiers. And we're hoping, we've already uh, met, that's part of the reason I'm out here. I was in Lyon for a week for the big uh, uh, W3C annual uh, conference to try to reconcile these things. So we went to their meetings, they came to our meetings, and we're trying to reconcile some things. They are trying to address some other things in the in the web ID, including naming. If you notice, there are no names in a DID. There's nothing that says you definitively are Christopher Allen or uh, you know Pamela Lambert or whatever the the name is. That's we consider that in our community a verifiable claim. Other communities want to bind that at a different level. So we're going to resolve that. That's why we have a two-year time to basically resolve. Um, uh, international standard is to have the different approaches be reconciled and combined. Several in the back. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I noticed so you, you just talked in the uh, previous question about um, if you lose your identity, you still have a way to recover it uh, through going to authorities and stuff. And I also noticed uh, on the quite technical slide when you resolved the DID to a DID document that you looked up some schema on a regular URL. Um, can you talk a little bit more? Because what I'm seeing here is there's some element of centralization or like authorities that you still trust. Um, but, but this is all wrapped in like a sort of decentralized uh, framework or, or you, you sort of the envelope is everything is decentralized. So can you talk a little bit more about the, um, the sort of contrast here that I'm seeing between decentralized and, and uh, sure. centralized authority? Well, first off, decentralization is really hard. Um, you know, I'm the co-author of SSL TLS. I would say back in the 90s when we were working on that, we were going, oh, this is going to you know, solve all of these problems. Uh, we're no longer going to be have all of our keys with Microsoft or all of our keys with Visa MasterCard. Um, and of course, new forms of centralization have creeped in with Facebook and Google and, and all of this. So it's a never ending battle. So I want to be clear on that. Um, the, you know, there are, uh, 
a variety of different definitions of where the, the essential decentralization needs to be, and I'm not sure which one specifically you're speaking of. One of which is you talked about key recovery as being one of them. So I know, for instance, Sovereign, which is one of the larger uh, projects, is uh, doing key shares on their blockchain that are split up among the various people that you uh, are doing, you know, have in relationships with. Um, that's only one particular experimental architecture. There are many others that are that are being applied right now. Um, but key, the, you know, how to uh, store and recover keys securely and safely uh, is you know, a hard problem, and we are working on that. Did that help? <laughs> Got a few on this side here. I'm sorry. No, I'm oh, yeah. on this side here. Yes. We got a few questions too. Uh, so you had a progress bar earlier <coughs> that suggested that it was really pretty late stage. Um, so for the verifiable claims on an identity, what are the? Can you talk a bit more about the standards are settling in for keeping the privacy with those? So limiting the scope to one factoid. Correct. So um, there are three approaches to preserving privacy with a verifiable claim. Approach one is data minimization. So um, I can issue you a variety of verifiable claims with uh, a, uh, a small amount of information on each, rather than having this big thing uh, that says, you know, here is my address and my, my height and all this other stuff, and that's what I give to my, along with my birthday, to a bar in order to drink. Instead, I can just simply prove to you that I'm over 21. And uh, so that's called data minimization. Uh, the problem with data minimization is in some cases, I might go next door and buy a bottle of liquor and basically send that to my home address. In that case, I have to give them over 21 and I have to give them my address. And theoretically, the bar and the liquor store can um, collaborate and basically correlate those two pieces of information. So there are two solutions to that, one of which is uh, having what are known as pairwise DIDs. So I might actually have a different DID for every one of our relationships. And then the other solution is something called select cryptographic selective disclosure, where basically we're doing some uh, cryptographic magic to basically prevent that correlation from happening. So I'd be able to prove I was over 21 to both parties, but the two parties behind my back would not be able to prove to each other that those, uh, it, those pieces of information go together. These are experimental. Um, these are not required in, the, in any of the current specifications. They are being investigated by various parties. Uh, and I think the marketplace will determine where those lines are. My job as co-chair of the credentials community is to make sure that all of those experiments can happen. I mean, the example I give of my prior stewardship was in SSL TLS. We had a concept called perfect forward secrecy. Um, the marketplace decided early on that was too computationally intensive, caused too many problems. Uh, but when Heartbleed happened and we discovered, yes, it is a problem, oh, and by the way, in the last 15 years, our machine's gotten fast enough that we can actually do it, it was only like a year before lots and lots of uh, parts of the internet were doing perfect forward secrecy. So I want to design standards and approaches to things that the marketplace and people can decide where they want to draw some of their lines, but it's capable in the future when we need it to do things like full cryptographic selective disclosure. It's going to happen, so I ask straight out, what happens if I die, physically? So there are a couple of different choices here. Um, the, I mentioned earlier about the idea of stewardship and delegation. So most likely what happens is that there is a time lock that happens, uh, that at, at the end of that time lock, if you do not um, uh, respond, that some other party has some limited capability to act on your behalf. Um, I do this now with Bitcoin. Uh, I basically uh, have, um, uh, I've given my executor a Bitcoin key that has no ability to do any transfers of my funds because the, all of my funds are time locked such that it's not valid until a year and a day from now. So 
uh, that means every year I have to remember to move my Bitcoin to the next key or else my executor is going to be able to move it. If at some point in the future I don't move my key, he has the ability to give it to my heirs. So that's a very simplified one. Um, there are lots more uh, capabilities to do this type of thing that are emerging. Um, we'll see how they shake out. Um, I saw the World Economic Forum was as one of the organi uh, uh, organization, organizations there. So what is their stance on this? And is, can you also share with us any government regulators uh, being involved with this discussion? Yeah, so which, what was the specific entity? Company World or? Economic Forum? Well, it was one, right. one of your So the World Economic Forum and his forum has uh, engaged in a number of workshops on uh, digital identity, in particular in relationship to uh, uh, you know, the, the larger problem of refugee identity, uh, the, the unbanked, and um, there have been a number of different uh, pilots and prototypes involved with that. I haven't seen uh, their involvement as much in um, the what I would call first world uh, sovereign identity, but I believe that they've done some things with the sovereign association. So, sovereign foundation, excuse me. Hi. Hi. Yep. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, do you think that the technology level that we have currently is mature enough to to actually encompass or accomplish such an ambitious project? I mean, you, for example, said uh, don't put personal data in a blockchain. It's a very bad idea, of course. It's a very bad idea today. But do you think that at some point we're going to see technology development that's going to allow us to do such a thing? So to be clear, if you come to me and say my enterprise, my government, whatever, needs to be able to do a, a deployment that is going to secure the privacy and the rights of, you know, 100,000 people, a million people or whatever, I'm not going to recommend this technology. I'll tell you, go get a FIDO, go with the latest FIDO2, uh, UML, HIPAA, whatever, um, you know, sort of the, what I consider to be the peak of the old uh, architecture. But we have to start working on the architecture now. And these problems, the xenophobia, the Chinese social credit, ADHAR, et cetera, are also showing us that we've got to work harder on the longer term solutions. So yes, this is all experimental. This is um, you know, not something that um, you know, I'm going to uh, trust the human rights of you know, 10,000 refugees in a, uh, uh, you know, in a camp in Calais today. Um, there are more mature solutions for that. But we have to begin now. We have to start demanding these things now. I mean, even ADHAR. So ADHAR largely uses 1990s era technology and biometrics, et cetera. Uh, if they had basically followed the 10 principles of self-sovereign identity, in particular the first one, um, a lot of the abuses of it wouldn't be as bad. I mean, I, I think it would be, you know, still be a problematic system, but the real terrors of that system ha are more to do with the, the human principles and dignity principles. So we really need to get those out there. That's what I'd like to see a lot more. Question here. Um, so a question about when you send your identifiers over the internet. Uh, one question is, um, uh, how do you know that two different identifiers don't belong to the same person? You know, a civil attack. The other is, how do you know it's a person at all? You know, on the internet, no one knows that you're a dog. Uh, how does you know the idea address? Those? So it all depends on your trust models. Uh, so one of the the most typical ways, most common ways, is going to be by preponderance of identifiers. Also, all blockchain identifiers have implicit timestamps, so you have a certain amount of civil attack resistance, just the fact that you know, this has been established, an identity two years ago that's provably happened, started two years ago, uh, and that you have a reputation for that. Uh, longer term, there's been some interesting uh, work on proof of personhood in anonymous scenarios. Anonymous scenarios are where you need to care more about civil attacks. And that's one of my, since I'm working on the more anonymous version of uh, digital identity, that's something in particular. Uh, so there's this thing called uh, proof of personhood. Um, uh, Brian Ford at 
I'm forgetting the institute in Lausanne, uh, yeah, is, uh, it has been doing some things there. And the way that works is literally we would, in effect, here at this meetup, all um, register that we're participating in a proof of personhood party. Uh, and the way it works is that we're not doing, we're not in San Francisco. Uh, so it basically says that this group of people here are not in San Francisco which, where they're doing another meetup or another type of event. And over the course of several of these types of events, you can basically prove that you're a neat, unique person even though you have an anonymous identifier. It's kind of a cool technology. There are other approaches. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, assertion, uh, web of trust type scenarios for solving this as well. Great. Thank you so much, Christopher, for this amazing talk. Give <laughs>